Let's see how much of what you have suggested is cons and what else am I going to offer that has not been offered? Okay? Whoops. So these are the core tasks that I want to walk you through. And then we're going to see how these are implemented. So the ability to develop, monitor, and maintain a collaborative therapeutic relationship. So many of you have highlighted what I was noting is the most important ingredient in predicting outcome. One of the things that's interesting in the literature is that if you cannot develop a therapeutic alliance by the third session, the likelihood of being successful are minimized. And in fact, one of the things that's interesting from the literature is that behavior change, that being effective early on, can actually improve therapeutic relationships. So it's not an either-or kind of approach. So the degree to which you're empathic, the degree to which you can engender a trusting relationship, the degree to which you are actively listening, the degree to which you are monitoring the effectiveness of the therapeutic alliance, the degree to which you're assessing people's theories about what it is that causes their problems, what changes have they attempted in the past, are all going to be a key element. Moreover, as I've been highlighting, the degree to which you are culturally, developmentally, and gender sensitive becomes important. This gender sensitivity is really going to take on significant proportions tomorrow when we talk about addictions. There is clear evidence that women versus men use substances in a different fashion, that there are different biological processes, and I'm going to advocate that if you're working with addictions, that it would be really valuable to have gender-specific intervention groups, rather than just throwing everyone into the same kind of group. Tomorrow we're going to talk about borderline personality disorders, where there are four to five times more women who receive that diagnosis. You're going to actually see uh, interviews with patients who, who have been receiving that kind of diagnosis. And one of the things that becomes apparent is that given my commitment to a constructive narrative perspective and storytelling and a strength-based approach, I am going to highlight the need for you to get what Paul Harvey, the radio commentator, called the rest of the story. I'm going to give you a variety of strategies on how you can identify what people have been able to accomplish in spite of how to use timelines and other procedures so that they can see what it is that they've accomplished over and above the diagnostic label that they received. Our job as therapists and being expert is to find the person behind the DSM diagnosis and have them take that data of their life experiences as evidence to unfreeze the beliefs they come in with, how to bolster their own efficacy, and how to become a detective, that curiosity that was mentioned, and how to anticipate future barriers, setbacks, lapses, and the others. How do you put yourself out of business and teach your client to become their own therapist. In terms of the art of questioning, you're going to see that one of my favorite questions to ask a client is the following. I say to the client, let me ask you something a bit different, a bit unusual. Do you ever find yourself out there in your day-to-day -day experience asking yourself the questions that we ask each other right here? That's a very clever question. Do you ever find yourself out there in your day-to-day -day experience asking yourself the questions that we ask each other right here? What am I doing by using that question? I'm saying, you know what therapy is all about? It's the ability for you to become your own therapist. You know what's going on here? 
is we're modeling a style of thinking that we hope you engage in out there on your own. So the whole name in the game in terms of that therapeutic relationship and also that we'll come into is how do you get people motivated to want to work? How do you use the evidence-based intervention of motivational interviewing in order to develop empathy, develop discrepancies between the way things are and the way they would like them to be, to support self-efficacy, and to nurture social supports in their efforts to engage in that kind of activity. The amount of treatment engagement becomes absolutely critical. I'm going to talk about what expert therapists do in order to get people to self-monitor, do homework, follow through, take their medications, and the like. 